respect you, but... What independent woman are you talking about? This is a bullshit concept, independent. What independent woman? You won't see nothing as an independent woman because... Because why? 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 They're coming up more. This is the conversation we have. And here, the man cave got light up. When the young, the independent, you yes, understand? They screw in the world and do what they want to do. When they get old and lonely, you yes, understand? Then they holler, oh, I'm depressed. You yes, understand? First of all, I think your analysis was very straight line. The street doesn't run in a straight line. Kid, you cannot tell your neighbor he is stealing ducks when you are stealing phones. As High Commissioner, I was wrong. As Charandas Prasad, I reacted naturally how any person would have. I did not come here for food for that kind of abuse. I did not come here for that kind of abuse. If you're gonna go along that road, I'll walk off. But it's all okay once they're talking. If they were talking, I could not have been here today. You got ADHD. No, no. no, calm down, calm down. I think I've done enough in terms of taking our team um, out of trouble from losing. Come on, Lou Taylor. You got that's good. I'm reading the script now, and the first person that comes to my mind to play a detective, yes, but an erratic. Good. The doctor is Mickey Rodriguez. Why you don't feel good supper in your Why a man and supper woman? No, you deal with that. You deal with that. We must encourage platforms like this because it brings together different people and allows for discussions to, to take place in our country and a multiplicity of fundamental issues. Uh, KW, you apologizing for no, something no, 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 you no, think no. I did is wrong. I don't no, no. want you to do that and you should not have done that. You are watching the Gildari Freddy Kisun Show. We come to you Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 8.30 to 9. When it's calling, we go half an hour extra. We have a call-in program this evening. A couple of things, announcement to be made. Leonard Gildari is back in Guyana. He will be here on Monday. We have a program on Monday. We usually work on holiday. It's Gary come day. So we will be here at 8.30. The mayor who's supposed to be on the panel, could not make it because he has a, an emergency with his uncle. Unfortunately, his uncle suffered a stroke. So we wish his uncle well, and we offer our condolence to the mayor. So we have with us tonight our panel, two panelists that were advertised this morning. Gerald Pereira has been around Guyana as a political activist and a Pan-Africanist for the longest while. We have known each other since we were teenagers. He was in the YSM in the 70s. He has traveled the whole of Africa and has socialized with some of the leading Pan-Africanists in the world. This is a man of wealth of experience and you could call in and ask him about his thoughts about anything. He has contested three consecutive national elections. Two. His, par two. Yeah. His party is called the Organization for the Victory of the People. And he said to me on many occasions and wrote letters in the press that the 2020 election was a revelation for him. The other panelist is one of the younger ones in Guyana that will take over hopefully from people like Gerald and myself and all of us who are in our 60s and early 70s. This is a fine analyst of extreme competence. I would regard him as the leading financial analyst in Guyana today. You read this man's analysis on 
the oil industry, oil to gas prospects, and the financial dimensions of the oil industry in Guyana. And you see, you see where it's an, the analyses are intellectual rebuttals to those who speak about the pitfall of the oil industry and don't know what they are talking about. When Mr. Bagwandin come on the screen, you will remember him, or we call him the past year, we had him here three times. We've had Mr. Pereira here twice. We have a call-in program after the analysis and the exchange, and please feel free to call in and ask the two gentlemen anything. You're quite free to ask Joel anything about the oil industry you don't understand. So wait until the discussions are finished, and then we will take your calls. We will ask you to be brief and let um, the respondents do the assessment and the evaluation. So alphabetically, B is before P. So Joel, thanks for being here again. Thank you for having me, Freddie. I think you're overselling me a little bit too much, you know. No, no, I know when people, Gerald, when people speak <laughs> like that about me, I, I, I don't like it. But you are not speaking about yourself. I am speaking about you. I think you fill a void in the discussion on the oil industry. And what I need to announce when you were here, the last time I announced that Kaicho News as a policy does not carry a letter and have not been carrying letters the past two years. That is something we have not seen people discuss. Here is a fine intellectual mind that writing, you know, you know, one of the things that struck me was your analysis of the financial foundation of the APNU AFC government. I really like that analysis of how, when they came in, what they inherited, and when they went out, the, the, the decline in balance of payment, the decline in um, foreign exchange earnings. But why I say that is because um, I, your, I believe why Kaicho News is not carrying your stuff the past years, and why Starbuck News carry your pieces once every three weeks, once a month, is because I think together with Dr. Randolph Passard, the advisor to the president, they, they, they don't want those kinds of analyses. They don't want those kinds of intellectual debates to flow, to be made visible, because I think it undercuts their extensive propaganda about the oil industry whose main purpose is to weaken the government and people like you and Randolph Passad, your arguments are very persuasive and therefore I want to announce to the thousands who view this program, read Joel Bagwandin. Maybe you could ignore what he says about the Barbies Bridge, what he says about agriculture, what he says about the economics of infrastructure. Read what he says about the oil industry because it's good, good outstanding rebuttals to a school of people who denigrate the oil industry investment for their own narrow purpose. Having said all of that, we start alphabetically with Joel. Joel, you would not know this because I don't know if you were born then, but when Joel and I were young, we saw police stations didn't have vehicles. We saw GPL uh, can't come when a, a, a fire is sparking, a wire is sparking outside your home. They didn't have vehicles. The public hospital was bare. My mother died at the public hospital for want of modern treatment. You were too young or weren't born to see how empty and vacuous 
was the economy of Guyana. We lived through those days, Gerald Pereira and I. Now, Joel, I'm asking you, finally, I think we have got there where we can look and see modern hospital facilities from in the public sphere. I think the Joshua Hospital is going places. I was there for treatment of my knees and I have no complaints. I have, I have seen that you can call the police station for noise nuisance and they come. My question, Joel, is are we finally getting there? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I may not have, you know, as uh, I don't have the age as you do to have experienced those days, but um, I, I certainly study the economic and social history of this country. And in terms of the economic, the macroeconomic outlay of the country, we came from an era of, of bankruptcy to economic uh, stability, and now we are, not, we are on a path of economic development, economic transformation, and in every sense of the word. Transformation in terms of the physical transformation of the country, the physical transformation of infrastructure, the quality of services um, delivered to the people, public goods and services. We may not be experiencing the quality, you know, immediately, but it takes time, but we're certainly on that trajectory to get there. Of course, the quality of human resources as well, you know, by virtue of investing heavily in education, having, making scholarships available to thousands of students across the country, uh, providing for accessibility to um, tertiary level education through a hybrid a, a hybrid um, system whereby students can now in the in in in, in remote areas rural areas ha do online studies and so on right here with her uh, at university of Ghana and other institutions so certainly we are on on, on a path of of transformation and we can only expect once we maintain this path we can only expect that to improve you know over time thanks Thanks, Joel. Um, Joel, before we come to you, let's um, announce to those who have just joined us. The mayor could not have um, make it this evening. His uncle suffered a stroke, so he's over in the West Coast there. And um, we wish his uncle well, and we offer our condolences and sympathies to his ailing uncle. Leonard Gildari came back from overseas treatment and will be with us Monday. There is a, a program on Monday. Now, our phone line is on the screen and at 9.30, please feel free to call us, offer your comments or ask questions. We go right now to one of Guyana's long-standing activists. And when I say long-standing, <laughs> we know each other over 50 years. We were young, crazy, radical leftist anarchist in the <laughs> 70s. Gerald, uh, it's been a long journey for you. Yeah. What are your thoughts about Guyana 2023? Okay, uh, Freddie, thank you for having me on your program. For the third time? Yes. Uh, there are only two programs I would appear on, and that's this program, and I appear on Christopher Ram, because my politics is very ideological and philosophically driven and i would not appear in other programs for many reasons for the vulgarity and nonsense that passes for debate um having said that today i am committed to what michael lorna refers to as a politics of meaning you know regaining hope and possibility in the age of cynicism. And I believe in a win-win politics. I don't believe in confrontation for the sake of confrontation. I'm not anti-government. I'm not opposed to the PPP government, nor am I pro-PPP. I am for pro-truth, pro-justice, 
and I'm opposed to all forms of injustice, oppression, racism. And I believe that as Guyanese, we should jealously and zealously guard our sovereignty. I'm firmly opposed to external agencies and powers interfering in the domestic affairs of a sovereign nation state such as Guyana. Good. Having said that, 20, today where we are, no one can deny, unless you're intellectually dishonest, that there have been advances and uh, improvement in some areas. But, Freddie, you know, development is a very contested term and concept because very often people see development as all this massive physical infrastructure, new buildings going out, the latest cars, roads, and all of that, uh, technology and so. But at the end of the day, does it touch people's lives, the average person in the street? I mean, look at Brazil. Brazil produces from a Pinta missile, and there's tremendous poverty. Uh, and many other countries that, you know, you'll see all the latest and so, but there's a widening gap between half and half nuts. And ever since Mr. Hyde came into office, when Mr. Hyde came in, and he, the IMF imposed the, what you call the uh, Washington Consensus or the, the Structural Adjustment Program, which they call the ERP. ERP. And the WPA at the time called it the uh, empty rice pot. Right. right. Uh, empty so, rice pot. Yeah. And then they start to privatize and sell off state assets. And so, so if today, if you're going to talk about the marginalization of uh, a section of the society, then people have to identify exactly the period that it started. But because a black leader was in office, you couldn't, no one spoke about the marginalization of Africans, but the very economic system that we started, the, the model, the neoliberal model, started to widen the gap. So what you, I am not saying, of course there are improvements, but I believe that given the model that we are operating with, I think we are going to see the concentration of wealth in fewer hands, unless, unless the government takes a more uh, state-led and uh, development and state intervention. I know of no country in the world. I know you're a historian. You did history. We did e economic history. And so I know of no country in the world where the private sector led the charge in development and build country. Private sector is not in the business of building country. So when they talk whether it's Singapore or Dubai or what, it has always been state-led. And the countries that achieve tremendous, that use oil wealth, to raise high standard of living, it's like in Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, that it was destroyed, and Libya, those countries, they took firm positions against uh, the oil companies, and they paid a price it. In Guyana, in Guyana, the debate about Exxon and so, you know, some people, they're not pointing to the elephant in the room about Exxon, there, something is, they're hiding something from the masses of this country. Let me tell you, what is the unwritten agreement? The unwritten agreement. Exxon is the security guarantee against alleged Venezuelan invasion of Guyana. That's why Exxon could get away with what they'll get away. And unless, Exxon is not an ordinary company, Exxon is an arm of the U.S. government. When you push Exxon like Venezuela did, Venezuela is paying the price of that. Venezuela is paying the price of that. Exxon is no ordinary. Look at the U.S. ambassador, Siran Lynch. She came out and she spoke about the sanctity. She praised the previous government and this government for uh, preserving the sanctity of the contract. And she doesn't represent Exxon. She represents the U.S. government, but she certainly understands the nexus between the U.S. government and, and uh, Exxon. So there are people who want to beat up on the government, on the contract and Exxon, but they don't want to go further because to go further, you will have to take an anti-imperialist position, right? And when you take on Exxon and the U.S. government, you're going to be sanctioned. Your assets in the States, if you got your bank accounts, many of them have bank accounts, in the states it's going to be frozen your children and all of them will be 
the visas will be revoked and all that. So the whole added monkey know what limb to jump on. Before I pose a question to Joel Bagwandin, the line, the number is on your screen at 9.30. Please call in and put your questions to our two panelists or offer your comments. Our third panelist, the mayor of Georgetown, um, his lordship, the mayor, his uncle suffered a stroke this evening and he was not able to make it. And again, we wish um, his uncle speedy recovery and we offer our sympathies. Monday, we'll be back with Leonard Gildari. Uh, I, I listened to you. Uh, I listened to you, um, Gerald. And at the end of the day, you have to ask the question, so what is wrong with a small developing country trying to get out of poverty? What is wrong with them accepting uh, investment from an oil company named Exxon, which I think is all, also has Chinese um, participation? Yeah. Joel, you heard you heard that. I I certainly let me say this for the record. I certainly welcome the oil industry investment, and I think uh, it's been a pattern of the world the past a hundred years in the post-colonial world. The foreign investors come; they're not coming as angels. They're not coming to um, hand you gifts. They coming to invest. The question is, if you say we don't want these big companies, how do you get out of poverty? Freddie, I want to <clears throat> comment on what uh, what's his name? Gerald. Yeah. What Gerald has mm. said. I, I, I absolutely agree with Gerald's argument. In fact, that's the exact argument I made. I would have written uh, several pieces on that particular uh, notion mm. and I dedicated about three series to the geopolitics of oil mm. and I referenced the Venezuela case and in the case of Venezuela the oil companies were they, they went to court and they had to pay Venezuela had to pay Exxon 10 billion dollars mm. and Correct. They had to pay Exxon co-venture partner uh, 30 billion. So that's Sorry. 40 billion US dollars. Correct. We don't have that kind of Hardly money. We don't have that kind of money. And then apart from that, I want to, I just, before I came to this program, I was in a meeting with, uh, with a, a gentleman from the diaspora from Canada and another, another one of his, his friend who is a businessman. And we were talking about the same thing. And the guy was saying that, listen, he's not into politics. He don't wish to discuss politics. And, but, you know, he was talking about Kaicho News. And, and he says, you know, yes, we'll agree. Some of the things Kaicho News publishes say is trash, but he thinks um, some of it is true. And then I, I listened to him for a while. And he said, you know, Glenlal said that Trotman wrote in his book that the contract could be renegotiated. And, you know, there is a clause that says it could be renegotiated and there, there is no clause that says it could be renegotiated. So I said to the, I said to the gentleman, I said, he's in the car dealership business, right? And I use a simple demonstration. I said, you're, you're in the car dealership business. Mr. John here, I'm using a random name. He enters into a contract with you to supply him cars for, for the next five years at a particular fixed price, mm -hmm. right? That's locked in for five years. One year into the contract, he, Mr. John, retires and hands over the business to his son. His son comes and review the contract and say, hey, he's four year, he's one year into the contract, four year remaining before it expires. He says, hey, uh, this price can't work. We need to, you need to give me something more here. And I asked him, I said, what do you do? He says, the contract, the five-year contract stands. And that is how any contract operates. You don't renegotiate a live contract 
or an active contract. And Glenlal loves to use this example with Trinidad PM uh, mm -hmm. about Trinidad renegotiating their contracts. Mm -hmm. But what he's not telling the nation, because I verified this, I spoke to the for a former energy minister in Trinidad mm -hmm. who's familiar with the situation to f and to verify what did Trinidad do exactly. And what he said to me, Rowley never renegotiated a life contract. He renegotiated a contract That's towards correct. the end when it That's expired. Correct. That's correct. So every contract has a life. When the government came that. into power, the contract moved from development into production in December of 2019. By the time the government got mm -hmm. into office in August 2020, they were already producing. So you can't break a life contract. So that so there are many variables to, to that apart from the geopolitics and investors' confidence and a whole bunch of other things. So I want to I want to put that put that out there for people to understand. Think of it though, don't worry with this comp too much of complexity. Think of yourself. Think of you entering a simple rental agreement for your apartment. You have a one year rental agreement at a certain price. So the property next door goes up by 200%. The landlord comes to you, listen, I need to match this. What do you do? Are you going to break that contract? And there are, there are laws to protect, to protect you. So you've got to be simplistic. You know, go back to basics to make sense of this nonsense these guys are talking about. That, you tell me I'm, um, I'm overselling you. That's the kind of thing that should find itself right. in the Starbuck News and in the Kaichu News. But when that kind of analysis goes in the Kaichu News, people read it and they say, what is Glenar talking about? This little guy has a point. I noticed something Melinda Janke did, which was quite contemptuous and distasteful. She replied to you and said, a certain letter in the papers, she didn't say Joel Bagwandin, a financial analyst that perhaps knows more about the finance of foreign investment than her. But you see, when I read this thing by Melinda Janke, if I'm asked by a student, why did Janke say, I read a letter in the papers? Why she didn't say, I'm responding to analyst Joel Bagwandin? You know why she did that? She did, did not want to mention the name Joel Bagwandin because then the person interested in oil and its dimension go, goes on the net and, and punch in Joel Bagwandin. So she obfuscated your name mm. so people would not have access to you and read your rebuttals to her. That's the kind of all critics we have in Guyana today. But, um, Gerald, given, given the, I don't think, I don't think anyone will disagree. I've seen um, the former president, Ramatar, came here. He is um, in the PPP Central Committee. He's part of the management of Red House, yeah. which is called Chedi Jagan Memorial. Sorry, sorry. And he said the contract is not, uh, you, you know, uh, his word is, I think he more or less said it's not a good contract. But if it's not a good contract, do we just say, I'm asking you, both of you, in a small post-colonial word that for, word that for 70 years trying to get out of poverty. Do we just say this is this is a lopsided contract? Thank you, sir. You can leave. So let me make another point. Right? The government, as as you use that example, again, as I was walking out of the meeting, I was stopped by another individual at at the entrance, he called me. I don't, I don't know the individual. He called me Bagwandin. You Bagwandin? So I said, yes. He said, come. You think this country going anyway? 
I said yes. What do you think? He says this country going nowhere, and I I agree with Tom Sanzillo. So when he said Tom Sanzillo, I he's stopped. been reading you. He's been he's been reading you. me right. Now I said, tell me, pose a question. I'm supposed I'm supposed to be somewhere in fifty minutes. I'm gonna give you ten minutes. What is? Tell me, tell me what you want to ask me. Why you don't see this country going anywhere? He says, don't you think Exxon is plundering this country? Don't you think Exxon is raping this country? Don't you think is he agrees with what Tom Sanzillo, which I already bought it. Don't you? I, he says, I agree with Tom Sanzillo that only the oil company can benefit. I said, Chief, let me tell you something. You have two types of government. You have a weak government and you have strong governments. To deal with Exxon, you need a strong government as well as that strong government needs something else. They need to be shrewd. Right? We have a strong government and a shrewd government. Unfortunately, people do not appreciate because you have the Glenn Lal, the John Keys, the Tom Sanzillo, they dominate mainstream media. And people think, oh, Exxon, you know, taking advantage, raping this country and all of this. But nobody, I'm the only person who's been saying it and trying to demonstrate how this government has managed to deleverage the power that they have to deal with Exxon. Because when you're negotiating, when you're negotiating anything, you negotiate based from a position of power. You have to have some basis Strength. to leverage, mm -hmm. right? I said the fact that... And I explained what I explained to you just now about why the contract wasn't negotiated. I explained that to the individual. And I said the fact that the government opted not to renegotiate the Stabrook block contract, that in of itself gave the government power to leverage. And what have they leveraged? People don't know this. And this is the first time I'm going to say this publicly. The gas to shore project that everybody is beating up the government about. Exxon is not happy about the gas to shore project. Exxon never wanted to do the gas to shore project. They never wanted to do the gas to shore project. In fact, they were driving a campaign using multiple maneuverings. And I know about this because I was within the maneuvering and I was in a position where I blocked one of the maneuvering. I blocked one of the maneuvering where they hired uh, a, a, a big four form to talk to the government and tell them all the reasons why they shouldn't do the gas to shore project. And I was working with that form and I said, no, you're not getting access to the government. You're not going to the government with this nonsense. There are many ways. The reason why the gas to shore project is not good for Exxon because it reduces profit oil so they get less profit. But while it reduces profit oil, the country gets less profit as well. But that cost to build is a direct benefit to the country. So that is one thing the government was able to get that the previous government would not have been able to get. Secondly, local content. Exxon never wanted the local content. Exxon fought against local content. I was part of the architecture that created local content mm -hmm. at a private sector commission level. I would have coordinated, put together submissions of my own as well, what should be in the... And I continue to do so, right? Together with other colleagues in the private sector. So I've been there from the making of the local content. Exxon, and you hear the vice president talk about this, Exxon never wanted it. Today we have the local content. Those two gains, the local content legislation, the gas to show project, would result in the country tangibly benefiting in an additional additional two billion dollars two billion us dollars a year mm. those two projects those two items right so right now we're getting about a billion dollars a year from current production 
because of the shrewdness of the government, because of the strength of the government and they understand how to deal with Exxon, how to leverage whatever whatever basis of strength they have that they can leverage to get other things to compensate for the loss. They have done so and they've gotten two billion dollars more a year. That's four hundred billion dollars, G dollars. Why you know you're not going to understand that. You're not going to see this kind of analysis mm -hmm. so in the newspaper. Gerald? Why is uh, Trotman saying that the contract could be renegotiated? Tr tr so I ordered the book because I need to read. You ordered read my copy, book. right? Yeah. So Trotman is saying that I, I, I don't want to get personal, but you know, when you're in retirement and you, you're having, you're reflecting on your life. Mm -hmm. My analysis, he's at that point in his life where... You know, he's, I don't want to say what comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, but he's reflecting on his life and he's he's written a book about it, right? But he is not in a position where he could be held accountable because it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So yeah, he can he's see retired. anything. He's retired yeah. from politics, mm -hmm. in fact. Yeah, yeah. And, and I understand he has some, some health issues as well. No, why I ask the question is because to be honest with you, let me tell you something. I don't read the letters and the comments by people like uh, Trotman, unless, you know, I read the book, but uh, letters by Dr. Vincent Adams and all of them. They were there, they were in office. They up new FC when they signed that lopsided contract. And I, when President Jack Dio was in opposition, uh, Vice President Jack Lee and the PPP were in opposition. He said that they will renegotiate the contract. And I was asked if I think they would, they would renegotiate the contract. And I said they were not. And that's exactly what happened. They did not renegotiate the contract. I want to know what is it that changed that that you know brought about that you see you uh, see you see the, change the, of, the media uh, the media you see the media has or position that they took the, the, let me speak to that let me speak to that here you see the media mainstream media and others who who took that clip the government said they were going to renegotiate they do not it's like the opposition the other day submitted some comments on the petroleum bill and this should have been in and this the building got this and a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. but those things are dealt with in other areas in other acts already other pieces of legislation they don't understand the framework when the government said then when in opposition that we're going to renegotiate those contracts the government did exactly that they have done exactly that because it's not this tabrook block PSA alone is this sector. A government has to speak from a perspective, from a macro perspective, because they're managing an entire country. So they're speaking to the framework. What is the framework for the oil and gas industry? The legislative framework, for example, you have the Petroleum Act, which is going to soon be repealed. There is now a petroleum, a, a modern updated petroleum bill to replace that old act. So that is the first piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Then the industry has, you have the environmental component, you have to get permits from the EPA. So they have to be compliant with the EPA Act, the Environmental Protection Act. Mm -hmm. You have, the, and then you have the production sharing agreement, which is the production agreement for the production of the, of the crude. So it is the entire framework. Then local content is part of that framework. So it is not just this tabro block. When that production, when that license, that 1999 license was issued, there were 10 in total. So there are nine other hmm. exploration license, active license for nine other blocks, right? So while this tabro block is going to remain because the Starbrook block is the only block that is producing. You have nine other. Look the other day, CGX finally struck oil. Yeah, so so CGX, now when they move to production, they are not going to get the same conditions of the Starbrook block because all of them had the same conditions. 
So by changing the new, bringing the new fiscal terms in a new production chain agreement that is draft that is to be soon to be finalized, that now will be applied to this new commercial field that is going to be developed, which is CGX. Then you have nine, then you have eight others, which Exxon is also involved in. You have the Kanji, you have Kaichor and all the others. Then you have these new blocks that are going to auction several of them that the new fiscal terms so when they say that they're going to renegotiate and they're going they're doing exactly that by changing the entire framework not only the fiscal terms but the act and everything else so the government did not walk back on any promise i want to i want to go over to gerald and look at the role of the media in the in the area of criticism of the oil industry and other things. But if for some reason you just join us, our panelists is financial analyst Joel Bagwandin and long-standing radical political activist of the left, Gerald Pereira, who has chalked up more than 50 years of activism. Our calling starts in 15 minutes time. The number is on your screen call in and talk about anything that you want to in relation to the expertise of our panelists. Joel Bagwandin is one of the experts on the oil industry and has written a copious amount of, of, of commentary in it. I, I'm not an expert. <laughs> You've written a lot in it. Uh, he may want to say he's not an expert, but what are the criterion or the criteria you use to become an expert? Well, I don't know. Maybe you could call in and, and see who then is an expert. I read a letter on November the 17th, 2022, in the Starbuck News that was signed by more than 20-something people, 20-something persons talking about the oil industry and the data. And when I look at this, See, the signatures at the bottom of it, not one of them, not one of them was an expert in oil. Two of them were people who uh, were qualified in literature, the humanities, a lady who's a novelist, <laughs> another guy who, oh, oh, oh I, I don't want to get there. So who really is an expert? Now, Joel said he's not an expert. Fine. But who are the experts of the oil industry that writes copiously in the Starbuck News and the Kaicho News? Now, perhaps the most laughable dimension in the criticism of the oil industry is Glenal, a semi-literate man who perhaps doesn't know anything at all about the world of finance or economics. And for the past three years, Glenn Lal parades on the newspaper he owns as an oil expert. But let's, let's look at the media. Now, Gerald Pereira has said to me quite often that his letters are not carried in the newspapers. He wrote a reply to Takuma Ogunse, a very fine reply from an experienced Pan-Africanist, and it was not carried in the Starbuck News. Joel Bagwandin says, said to me, if he sends in five, two will get published. We have an oil industry that has generated intense debate intense intellectual debate, intense debate on foreign investment. But only one set of people that I refer to as the usual suspects get published. What is the state of our media in Guyana today from the days when mm -hmm. um, you and I were young people in the 70s? Freddie, I'm very much disappointed with what what i'm seeing it's 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 terrible you know when they are 
when uh, the 2015 elections was uh, over, I wrote a letter, very skated letter uh, about Brian Hunt, the last, the, the former charge of the U.S. Embassy in Guyana and his rule in the 2015 election. I listened to uh, Mr. Hyde Ali in the program here when he was referring to one, one the word one yeah, yeah. 2015. and i wrote that letter and uh it was mark ramatar was the editor at the time and it ended up in the the uh, chronicle the ghana chronicle but he was roasted for it by uh the then prime minister and he had to publish uh, he had to put a, a sort of he made a reply saying that the letter, they didn't even mention my name or the organization, right? Because, uh, and then it said that they would thank Mr. Hunt for his role and everything. I participated in the 2015 election. We offered critical support to the APNU FC. We told people, we urged people to vote for them at the presidential level and to give us the regional vote. And I saw what took place then. And I saw the interference in the electoral process and in the national affairs of this country, and it's still going on. This, this country is sovereign on paper, only on paper. The media, the media in this country, you can see the line that they take certain people can write, I see certain people write letters and those letters appear one after the other every day. Uh, I've noticed the Kaichur news, I've sent letters to the Kaichur news and they're not appearing. I've sent letters to our Starbrook, yep, Starbrook published a number of them and some of them will not appear. And uh, there are other newspapers I've sent to the uh, Guyana Times I've sent letters to them and not published. So, you know, why I'm taking this line, you see, the reason why I write these letters and so is I have no axe to grind. And the media, we, I, I see the double standards, I see the hypocrisy in this society. I see those who are calling, who every day are saying that the government need to be transparent, the government need to be accountable. And those people, right, are not transparent, the organizations are not, and they are accountable to no one. I see the double standards. No one in this country could accuse me of being pro-PPP. None. I, if the PPP government is doing anything, if this government is doing anything to ease the suffering and the pressures to move the marginalized sectors of this society from the margins to the center to better their lives and their working conditions, I will support that government. I am not in the, we, we in the OVP, we are not in the, our politics is not one of opposing for the sake of opposing and picking a fight when there's no need for fight. When the government is doing things that are positive, they'll get our support. When they deviate or they're doing, they'll hear from us, right? I support, for example, I see people are using it in the media saying that uh, the ambiguous term about the one Guyana. I support the concept of one Guyana, but maybe my conceptualization would be different from others. Good. I, one Guyana is an egalitarian concept. If you are pushing for one Guyana, it means you're pushing, at least that's how I read it, for an egalitarian society. Good. It's not just about bringing all the races together. It's about trying to abolish, right, those wide that class differences, that widening gap between the have and the have nots, and uh, peacefully abolish them or bring about some transformation. Because we ain't getting revolution. And when I speak about revolution, I'm not talking about running wrong with guns and things. That's not it. We want a radical transformation of what I call this neo this plant neo-colonial plantation because when you look at it, it not only in Guyana in the Caribbean Freddie know this as of someone who did Caribbean history and so the social and production relations in our society 
hasn't changed much from the plantation. It has been, you know, there's some mo the modification and thing and all that, but the social and production relations, right? And, and the class issue in this country is what is important. And it's only the only person I see trying to address the issue apart. We have an educational arm called the George James Educational Institute. You can go online and check it. Name after George, James James, who is a great guy. And he's called, he wrote the book, uh, Stolen Legacy. But nothing in this country is named after him. And we highlight the class issue. But race, now race is a powerful dynamic. And class is. But race, the race issue in Guyana is used. The race divide is used by opportunistic politicians. Good? For their own agenda. When the issue here is a class issue, we have to address the issue of class. Good? Where the wealth is concentrated in the hands. The, the, you, know the, the, you know how many families in this country, you can count them, not more than 20, own the amount of land in this country. We have to. So when we talk about one Guyana, we have to start looking at how do we address democratization of the economy so as to bring about economic justice, how we are going to break this pile so that it could reach to all sections of the society other than trickling down. And these are issues, uh, certainly the sections of the media. And so when you write those letters and so, they don't carry it because they have a particular narrative. They're comfortable with those who are pushing uh, just race, race, race. And they will carry those. But when you bring in another set, when you uh, switch to identify certain things, they don't. They just ignore you. They don't carry the letters. Just in case you joined us at this time, one of our panelists is missing, and that's the male, because his uncle fell sick this evening, serious ailment, and he's in the West Coast with him. Uh, the other announcement we need to make is Leonard Gadari, who was outside receiving for health reason, is back and we will have a program on Monday at 8.30. We have a few minutes before we open the lines. Please call Gerald, please call and put your question to Gerald Pereira and Joel Bagwandin. And if you don't have a question, please make your comments um, brief. I don't want to take up much time, the time of Gerald and Joel, but two things need to be said. One is methodology in research. When you are near to an event, you don't see the subterranean dimensions. Correct. Long after the 2015 election, things surface. And during the 2015 election, there was not a US ambassador. And the man who was in charge of the US embassy was Brian Hunt, who after 2015 was posted to Mozambique. Mr. Brian Hunt was involved at an intricate level with um, GCOM. I don't want to go further because I don't want to get a libel from um, Dr. Suraj Bali. But one thing I know, it was a damnifying evil moment in any election in the world when you can gain, uh, when you lose a parliamentary seat by one vote and the election commission refuse a recount, that doesn't happen in the real world. If that one vote had gone to the PPP, the composition of the National mm -hmm. Assembly in 2015 would have been different. Let me assert and say with pellucid force, I believe Mr. Brian Hunt of the U.S. Embassy was involved in a type of behavior during the 2015 election that he should not have gone in that direction. And for that, I support Mr. Haider Ali's position when he sat in this studio last mm -hmm. week or two weeks ago and said, the APNU won, and he put the word won mm -hmm. in inverted commas. So 
about the media. It, I think it's disheartening that you can have someone, he's not an expert, he's a financial analyst, but it is disheartening that this young people like him sure. could come into Guyana in the 21st century, trying to make a difference in intellectual debate, in polemicizing, and his analyses are not carried in the mainstream media and every day a man named G.K.H. Lal, who has, uh, I think, financial interest in the Marawa waves, could write meandering, no grounding in concepts, could get a letter published every day in the newspapers. Hamilton Green can get three letters published every day in the Starbuck News. And uh, one of Guyana's most accomplished scholars, Dr. Randolph Posad, professor at the American oh, University, oh. cannot get his letters published. I, I, I mean, Joel, what is your state of mind in relation to this as a young man who has his whole life ahead of him in terms of his contribution mm -hmm. to his country? I'm watching the time, and it's near time for to call in. But let's hear Joel. Well, I understand the re realities and the, and, and, the, and the pragmatism of the real world. So it doesn't bother me because thankfully we're living in an information age, we're living in the internet age. So if a certain media house choose chooses not to publish my letters, it is published elsewhere. And this is precisely why I come on this program, because you, mm. there is still a medium, there is right. still a platform, there, right. are, there are alternatives. Let's hear this call. Good evening. Good evening, caller, you're on the air. Good evening. Hello? I don't know what's happening here. Could our operator see what's What's going on here? Let's wait until another call comes in. Hello? Yeah, well, I think, I think, Joel, before, let's just see. Hello, good evening. Hello? Yes, Ian. Press. Hello? Hello? Could an operator come in here a minute, please, and see what's wrong with this phone? But let's 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 call it. Could you call the number on the screen there? Well, let's see. Could our operator come in here a minute, please? Let's 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 call it and see what happens. Now you're calling it. What happens here? Now, there's a call coming in. You press here to, um... No, you press here. Adaiki, could you come in here, please? I don't understand why it's not, um... You press answer. No, it's this you press, please. Not answer. Hello? No. Um... Let's 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 cut it off and let's go again. Call call the number. Hello, that... good evening. Hello. Good evening. Yeah, you're on the you're on to the show. Good night, uh, Mr. Sadi Kisun. I want to congratulate you for the hard work that you are doing every evening. You have you have a question for our panelists, please, or a comment? No, sir. I want to compliment you for your okay. great work. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Let's let's go to another call. Um, if you don't have any questions for the panel or comment, okay. Thanks. Thanks for coming through. Um, I don't know what's wrong with this phone. Let's let's see. Well, yeah, yeah, Joel. But I think one. Hello. Hello? Hello? Uh, could our operator come in here again, please? Something is wrong. I've been 
We've been using this phone for the past year. I don't understand what's happening. Hello? Good night. Good evening. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I'm hearing all this topic in Guyana about oil. Just everything is about oil. But, Freddie, I want to ask you something. What about the past 57 years with all the other resources that Guyana have? How come the government never get it right? How come they never, the, 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 the way of life of people, it, it was never elevated? 57 years, two governments run this country. Two governments. With all the resources in this country. And they never get it right. And all they can talk about now is oil. They got to do something. They got to get it right. You know, you know, I listened to Mr. Pereira just now talking about you could count the amount of families that own the And that's so true. They got some people got land in this country. Thousands of acres of land. Let, let, I'm just and, and, and they got some means, they got some just, just, five acre land just to start a little okay. farm and they can't get it. Just stay on the line. Let me tell you something that I don't think is known or has been pronounced in economic analysis in this country. They they have been they have been cries and cries and cries against Indian wealth. Here is a piece of information that needs to be researched. Are you listening? Are you still? Yeah, 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 I'm listening. Do you know three Portuguese families? Mm -hmm. Three Portuguese families in this country own more land than thousands of East Indians True. put together. True. There are three Portuguese families in this country mm -hmm. whose actual ownership of land, whose actual ownership of land is more than the combined ownership of thousands and thousands and thousands of Indians. And you don't you don't hear about that. But anyway, thanks for calling and I'd ask our panelists to respond to you. Okay? Okay, sir? Good. You heard that? Yeah. Um I I I see the point that they Carla just uh, mentioned, and I agree with him, you know, suddenly this overemphasis on oil and oil, and we had, you know, gold, timber, and other resources at the time. There was a time when sugar was king, when sugar, sugar was doing well. And with all those resources, we didn't achieve, we, 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 went, we didn't go anywhere. But, so he's right, I don't see, I see that the if oil can just bring about this it, miraculous change but i do agree with freddie that those that three very powerful three very powerful portuguese family control tremendous land in this country more than um some sections of the Indians. there uh, isn't India. an indian I family know, in I, this I, country I there isn't an indian family in this country in there fact isn't there's about four there four isn't of a, them there isn't an indian family in this country no which Indian man or woman or family owns more land than one Portuguese family that I know? I'm aware of that. Right. But anyway, let's let's take this call. Hello? Good evening. Hello, good evening. Yes, you're on to the Gildavi for the Kisun show. Our panelists are Gerald Pereira and Joel Bagwandin. You have a question for them? Um, I have an observation, Mr. Kisun. Yeah. Um, in connection with Mr. Bagwandin, right, his, his comment um, in support of the government renegotiating the contract. In my mind, I feel it's a weak and vague attempt in just supporting the government. But, you know, Mr. Bagwandin has to do his thing. So, I didn't, and, I didn't, I didn't hear what he's saying. May, may not understand the question. He, he, he doesn't understand your comment in relation to him. Could you go again? It's an observation in the form of a comment. Because you're commenting on Mr. Bagwandin's attitude. Could you go again? Could you repeat yourself yes. so, so you can I get something? I being critical of his explanation about the government not reneging on their promise to renegotiate the oil contract and saying that is a big and weak attempt by Mr. Bagwandin. That's my my observation. Okay, so what is okay. your so what is your view if I may engage you because Mr. Bagwandin, that's my observation. I, 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 Mr. Kisun, I'm coming to 
you know, in connection with you, you criticizing Mr. Glenn, saying that, you know, he's not fit for this and that and whatever. No, you can't say but, it's weak and vague. It's like me saying this bottle is black. You got to tell me, convince me that this bottle is black. So convince me that the argument is weak and vague. I don't have to convince you, sir. You, you made have a comment. You, I have you an speaking to an I public, my You're speaking on a public forum, so convince the audience and me that my argument is weak and vague. You want to offer a counter-argument to... <laughs> no, sir, I don't want to. I want okay, to move okay. on to another okay. point. Okay, Th thanks for coming to you. Thanks. Well, that's the type of analyst you have, the, 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 the Tom Sanzillo analyst. And listen, this bottle here black. This bottle black. Ignoring the fact that this is not a black bottle. That's, that is what you have passing off as, as analysis or intellectual debate. Good evening. In the media. Hey, You're on to the good evening to you, uh, uh, Mr. Christoon. Hello. Yes, go on, go on. Yes, sir. Uh, I, got, I have a few questions to ask. Uh, uh, mostly the arises from Mr. Joe Bagwandan. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah, but my first question to you, uh, for you, Mr. Pistoon, is that do you remember a man by the name of Mr. Sham Juman? Yes, we were young, young together. I think. I yeah. think Javel Pereira would have known him too. Yes, Sham. But yes, I know Sham because we were young radical leftists Correct. in our late teenage years. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, that is my I'm, father, okay? That's your what? Uh, that, that is my father. I know he has died. Yeah, he has died. I'm sorry. But uh, my question will my be condolences. Mr. Joel. Yes, uh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I have heard, I have heard the conversation and uh, I've heard you talk about uh, being there to enforce the local content uh, creation for job opportunities for the young Guyanese. Um, that was very, very great of you. Uh, however, uh, I have worked in the oil and gas industry for a number of years on the FPSOs and the oil rig, uh, and on land. However, I have noticed uh, within the community, uh, the the arena of having the expert there and local content, there is much advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, the question is, right, uh, I have seen the disadvantages of Guyanese having the same level playing field that the experts would have had, um, such as, you know, uh, transport, uh, allowances, accommodations, and, and other things that there will be issues to. I know that, that they are entitled to because of the money exchanges within their countries would not add up to the same as within the Guyana economy. But do you think that if uh, they would level up and increase the salaries of the, the local content uh, employees so, um, a little bit more, uh, who is qualified, have their degrees and all of these things, um, what is the equivalent to say that, well, it, it, it's equal in the sense that, you know, we, people spend their money going and get education and get scholarships. I, uh, I, 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 hear, I hear you, brother, and I absolutely, the, 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 the question or the concern you're raising is not a new one. I've been hearing it constantly within the private sector. Many persons complain to me personally and vent it in, in many other forums. It is something that has to be addressed. Uh, we Right now, the local content legislation, and listen, the way Exxon, the way Exxon works, they would not, they do the bare minimum voluntarily. So for you to get Exxon to do anything, you have to legislate it. Mm -hmm. Right. So this I, I, I understand. I, yeah. I understand, and I'm seeing it also. And one of my another uh, another question is that so we got health and safety officers in all departments, all air arenas again, uh, offshore and onshore, uh, health and safety officers, mind you, health and safety officers, and they come in down on the locals for let's just say you're in an area and you made a mistake or so probably step on a steel or maybe you you, you cross a, a small barrier that that's there that is safe to walk but you know they come down on the guy and he's uh mind you again I'm saying local health and safety officers will look and penalize and you know come down on the guy and he's for a small 
precautions and then the experts, you know, they so, so let me get say, away with so anything, let, you know, and they, they don't say anything. In, in the interest because of they, they are afraid that, you know, if they, they talk to these experts, no, 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 listen, listen, they talk like, to these people, you know, they can get penalized. So, Okay, now no, listen. Don't you, go back to this so, so listen, listen to Mister. Listen, listen. So to listen to Mister. Bagwandan's response. You venting here, it, it would not have any impact. What I'm saying to you is, we've heard this complaint, and we need to do something about it. And if you're calling to do something about it, let's do something about it. The, right, so the government. So, so let me. So, so okay, let me tell okay, you okay. I'm not, I'm not you, yeah? you, you, so, I'm not complaining, but what I'm saying is that. So you got to wrap up yeah. now so we could give out the call. Yeah, man, listen. You have to wrap up now. You working in the industry. I want right. you to put down on paper in the form of a letter all these issues and send it to the ministry, send it to the Minister of Natural Resources for them to consider these issues to be addressed in the amendment to the local content legislation. We could talk all night about the, about the problems. I got issues with, as well which I have submitted. So I want to urge you, urge you to do that. Okay, right. so, so okay, so we got um, I'm coming to, right? you okay, know, so right, so we got it. Okay, we got to give way to someone else. No. Okay, thanks for coming through. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks, bye bye. <laughs> Time pass. No, no, we we have to go. No, we we've got um, 18 minutes more. It, we you go think up. man is all right, nigga? Um, well, but, um, <laughs> I want you're, to you're serving yeah. your country. On a point of correction, I wanted I want to correct something for the viewers. Let's, let's. Uh, let me let me let me correct this quickly. The, this notion that there is overemphasis on oil, it's we got to understand who is overemphasizing oil. Not the government. You don't hear the government preaching about oil, oil, oil. The government focusing on other major areas of, of development and positioning the country <coughs> is one particular group of people yeah, that yeah. have oil. Let, so let's I just want to call. clarify Theory. that. Hello? Here we are. Hello, sir. To Tom. Tune down your volume, sir. We're getting a feedback. Just just come off the phone. Um, okay, Freddy. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, go on. Uh, Mr. Joel and your and your friend there, Joel Pereira, the program, Mr. Pereira. Uh, if you remember in your early days, that uh, and as you said that you you know you got eight. When Bookers used to be there, and Bookers used to work in Ghana, uh, they used to operate a business. They export all the money out, and Burnham nationalized Guyana. And so all the millions of dollars these guys took out, we can get it here. So they don't have to export that money and it run Diana stores or then it bankrupt the country. Your buddy there, Mr. Ferreira, is saying he didn't see the money trip down to the normal uh, person at the bottom. All the roads are building, the hospitals are building, the all the infrastructure is going on in Guyana. Who is going to benefit? These guys think that this is in Canada or America. We could give them a check of welfare and still live on it. And when the money done, we rob or we thief. That's why we're living in this society. You have to work. In the days of the all, the Glenlal is a permanent loser. He he is a loser. He only made money based on, uh, on, on people's emotion. If he contributes the emotion where he got properly, Guyana can progress. I called Bernal, blocked me and picked off because I told him he's a loser. You have to come and work along with people. You cannot divide the people. Every day, Glenlau talks about money and oil and oil and oil. He has no life. If I told you God, Genlal is going back to the business he used to do years ago. Thank you. No, thanks for coming through, sir. Uh, to that last scholar, you know, the minute you raise the issue of, okay, if you talk about uh, giving some proceeds to the oil well 
to the section to the um, uh, citizens of the country. There's a counter argument about it. you will develop lazy citizens and people will sit and this and all that. It's amazing how those who who argue for the the, the so-called free market and against any sort of uh, so-called handouts to the people, how they, they go against it. But if you look around the world, if you look around the world, right, when big businesses fail and they need bailing out, who bail them out? Not other big businesses. Obama in 2008. Is mm -hmm. the government come to the rescue and then the government takes the money from the lower, from the working class and the middle classes and then the next thing they bankrupt. You want to see what's on? Let's take this card. Good evening. You're on to the Gildari Fadi Kisun show. Hi. You know, with two guests. Good evening. I would like to ask a question of Mr. Ferreira. Yeah. yeah. And um, the question basically is, it came from a gentleman by the name of Saul. I think he was a resident of Victoria on the east coast of the world. And he was saying that his village was one of the first villages to have gotten um, to have gotten this um, day, day thing on, on, on the go. I am originally, I'm a 77 year old. I am from a village called Bushak, a west coast of Bovis, a village similar to Victoria. Now, Victoria is a huge village. He, Mr. Saul, said that. And then he was in the papers asking and saying that the government has not helped the village. Now, I want to state to you, the panelists, that Bushak was not helped by any government. The people there work. They wear cows, they, they wear sheep, ducks, fowls, they did a farm, they, they planted their gardens, they caught fish, and they progress. If you take each dead bush that village and you go to Bobby, pass there anytime, and pass Victoria and see what is, that, what is Victoria like. Okay, okay Mr. Pereira doesn't understand the connection with Saul. He wants to know who Saul. Oh, uh, Saul wrote a letter in the paper. I am. I don't know him. Okay, but what's is the, this? Is this the Leland Saul from some institute? No, no, no. I'm not saying oh. that I know them, gentlemen. Okay, saying, thanks, thanks, Saul. Okay, thanks for coming to. Okay, thanks for coming to. So that Bye. is what. Thank okay, you. Yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts before we go to the phone again? You're getting a call? You're getting a call? Um, if, there's, if there's someone that wants you to um, answer anything, please feel free to, please feel free to go ahead. Yeah. You just say that you get a comment. I, I don't know if they call in relation to the show. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, this thing about... Uh, I, 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 and there's just a few set of people. And do you know, Gerald and Joel? Just let, let's 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 go to this guy. Ah, good evening. You're on to the Kilabi Fadi Kisun show. You have a comment or a question for Joel Bagwandin or Gerald Pereira? Well, you have a what? Well, You have a statement, um, a comment, and a question. <laughs> well, please make it, please make it brief, right? I will. Ready? Sit back, sit back. Take a sip of water, like, 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 like critic does. All right. Um, um, I don't have to do what critic does. Critic is critic. I am me. Just, all right. just me. Uh, I agree with your comments this evening on the sanctity of contracts. I'm a strong believer in that. Um, some folks may pick up my voice because I was in Guyana in the election period. I was a candidate of one of the small parties. Um, yes, your panelists are absolutely correct. You know, when you sign a contract, it, it is what it is. And you can't change it and expect that, well, it, it can be changed against you. So I believe in that. Second thing, I think Jack Deal, I, I'm 
I'm a black I'm a black man. Let me just put it up front so everyone knows that I'm not a PPP or PMC or APM. Uh, I think Diana is blessed with the fact that <laughs> someone like Jack Neal is still around because he understands the issues that this country um, approaches and encounters every day. And uh, I want to keep my verbiage in a very uh, salient manner so that everyone can understand what I'm saying. Uh, Freddie, I know you're academics, so you use the big words. Um, Jack Neal to me is. Not a little bit preeminent politician, but he's also a damn good economic, uh, economist. I criticize him in, in 2020, 2019, and I, I, I made a bunch of that. Um, Mr. Joe, back with him, I want to move on a bit here from that. Um, currency valuation. Let me ask a question. Um, do you think Guyana's dollar is currently pegged? Properly to the international market, and I'll throw something up before you answer that question for me. In 2021, I sold a piece of property and I got about four hundred thousand, four hundred fifty thousand dollars U.S. dollars for it. I took those to one of the international banks in Guyana. I, I want them to remain uh, nameless. I deposited those funds, and I told them in three days I would like to use move that money to the USA. I went back in three days and they told me I have to wait 12 days before I can get that money moved to USA because they don't have US funds. 2021. Okay. Now, I guess where I'm headed with this question is the kind of currency today, the exchange rate has been 208, 209 for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and if you're buying, it's even more. Um, but the, the problem is, you know, a Chinese businessman like Critic, let me give you an example. He bought a crane in London, or I don't know where he did. A Chinese businessman is at a significant disadvantage in competing with even Americans, Trinidadians, Barbadian companies because they have to put more Chinese dollars to buy one U.S. dollar. Let's keep it in the U.S. dollar denomination for now, because it'll get crazy if you start talking about euros and whatever. And at the same time, we're complaining about inflation in Guyana. And the problem is, I don't know, Joel, but I'm a technology economist. Uh, I'm, I'm in between that. Yeah, we got several. We, we got several minutes more right. remaining, so. Could you put the question to? Could you put the question quickly? The problem is we have a, 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 a disequilibrium going on in Guyana, whereby the demand for local currency and demand for U.S. currency is out of equilibrium, and folks abroad can more easily invest in Guyana than the Guyanese guy can buy and bring into Guyana. Just make you comment on that. I, I don't okay. believe in all this stuff. Okay. So here, I'm going to do... Thanks for coming to you, sir. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Thanks. I'm going to do you a special favor, sir. The, 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 the question about the exchange rate, um, it's it's not a straightforward issue. Uh, I, don't, I don't have enough time to explain it on air, and I don't want to explain it fully on air either. But I'm, but I'm going to give you my number. Call me as soon as we go off air. And, uh, and I'll... I'll engage you, right? Take my number. It's 652-1995. 652-1995. Before you go, before you go, that's a lot of that's a lot of US money you sold that property for. You sorty by 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 um using 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 class criteria. That's a You're a wealthy man. Five thousand five thousand no, 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 no. I brought it from America to Guyana and then I brought it back out of Guyana because I, I, I don't see any I don't see where in fifteen years it will so, grow as much as I so could have grown it. You want that. to tell us the name of the small party that I think it's you Change Guyana? To? Were you a member of the Change Guyana? <laughs> yes it's I was. Change Guyana. Oh yeah, the, 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 Mr. Badal. No, no, yeah, Badal's party. Mr. Badal. So you're no longer with Mr. Badal. 
Uh, but no, you know, what? He my because great I've yeah. never voted for the PNC, I've never voted for the APNU, I've never voted for the PPP. The only time I voted in Guyana was when there was a referendum in Serbia or something. Uh, that's the only time I've ever voted in Guyana. Okay. <laughs> Look, thanks for coming through. Thanks, thanks for coming through. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, let's check my uh, mango pelter here. We've got four minutes more. You know, uh, I, yes, that's, I just that's want it. to say, you know, uh, Joel pointed out about their uh, hospitals. You get in all these, uh, they're given permission for these various hospitals to open. Health care is a human right. It's a fundamental human right. And I don't believe it should be left to the mechanism of the market or market forces to regulate. I think it's not about giving out li pe license to people to open. No, those are very I know, but yeah. we need, we need to that Georgetown Hospital, the government, the state needs to set up. You can have those private hospitals, but the state need to be involved in building hospitals. I'll tell you something quickly, mm -hmm. and it's important for the history of this, for Ghana. You know, Libya with oil. They said, look, one day this oil is going to come to an end. So they used the oil money into massive agricultural projects, the man-made river, which is one of the great irrigation projects, right? And that was destroyed, damaged severely during the invasion. I recalled when Desmond Hyde was president, uh, the Libyans gave me a missive to bring to the then government that they were going to help Guyana with cheap oil price, with oil below the market price, help them with securing their borders, as well as to do over completely okay. the Georgetown Hospital. Let's take this call and then wrap up because yeah. my operator tell me we just have two yeah. more minutes. Hello, good evening. Please, um, please turn on your volume, sir. Hello? You have to turn down your volume completely. We're getting a oh, feedback. Oh, and time is going. Oh, You're the last caller. I turn it down. Yes, yes. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, yeah you want um, to... Can I, I just need to... Yes, I can help. Yeah. Can you use the oil money farm to market power? Don't run in the interior of four little rooms from Georgetown to Brazil. Because you connect me, connect to Brazil, connect to Venezuela, Colombia, and all this place. Then you can see the real wealth coming in the country. Then you, can, you have to use the Alma as You don't have to use the Alma that you hand out. But um, uh, the WP you want you hand out, you hand out to our uh, people. You have to do a foreign road to Brazil, a highway. Then you can see the real wealth in this country. Then you can see the real wealth far to market road. Uh, over in the interior. This country don't have roads. You don't have roads. And the gentleman said, when the hospital, you need health care. If we don't have a healthy nation, you don't have a wealthy nation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, after the, after Hoyt lost the elections to Jedi Jagan in 1992, a senior, I turned to a very senior and powerful figure in the then PNC government, and I said, why didn't the government of Guyana take up the offer from the Libyans. And you know what he said? He said Mr. Hyde rejected it, right? Because he didn't want to get into any trouble with the Americans. So much the, as you get back what no, I mentioned. You heard that? We, we need to build, I um, mean, to use our money to, our money to use, it, to build a four-lane highway to Brazil. Yeah. You, um, you agree with that? I don't see how anyone could disagree with it. Um, Dr. Mark Curtin has written a book. He'll be on this program but again called President Brazil Guyana Relation. And he has, um, he has literally said that we are neighbors to one of the great countries in the world and we should make use of it. Let's just take this call. Good evening. Hi, good evening, gentlemen. Yes, go on. Yes. So. I want to make a point and support what Mr. Pereira would have mentioned earlier. What's that? He's, he's saying that Guyana doesn't have a race problem. 
It's a class problem and I agree with him 100%. Why I agree with him, right? Because of the gap between the have and have not, that needs to be fixed. We live through all the life of the other resources. We have newfound resources that is taken up with speed like Mr. Bolt. The time to fix it is now. Why I said it, I could remember 23 years ago, I visited Georgetown. The bus that I caught was overloaded. The police stopped us. And I thought he was going to get locked up. The conductor came out and he went to the police. He jumped him back and the bus drive away. Tell the driver I fix the problem, let's go. If you drive on the road from Jarshan to Linden today, and you have 20 roadblocks, okay. everybody... Um, uh, be okay, quickly, so our operator signal to us that we're over time. Just quickly, and then we'll ask the two panelists to wrap yeah. up quickly. Yeah. So my point is that yeah, yeah. 23 okay. years ago, nothing has changed. Okay. The time is now. And if it don't change now, well, I don't know when it's going to change. Okay. You don't have a race problem. Okay. The is coming next yeah. few months. Okay, sir. Then you go to the stadium. Okay, sir. We got to go now. Thank so, you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, um, quickly, um, Gerald, and then um, the man who's not an expert. Freddie. Very quickly. Freddie, the principal um, contradiction in this country, apart from the class issue, is how do we address foreign capital that is plundering this country? We cannot deny that. And I think the government is between a rock and a hard place any government let me put it this way quickly even if let's say you know fortunes change and you get like an ovp government we will find ourselves too between a rock and a hard place because the G, the G, the issue of geo the geopolitical reality reality okay. is that when you're in this backyard you got to know how to navigate the waters, the so-called backyard. We gotta go, we gotta go. Um, Joel, what's the future Ghana like? You're not an expert, but you're a financial analyst, and you've been doing some good analyses. The future of Ghana is that I have to go home now, and I'm late, and mm. I think I've said well, that's your future, not the future of Guyana. <laughs> that's your future. Your future is being Listen, shaped by you have to go the home. The future is bright, but we all have to work hard. It's not gonna happen by magic. We all have to work together as a collective and solve all the, and, and to with the aim of solving the issues we have thanks you are watching the Gildari Freddy Kisun show Leonard Gildari is back he will be here on Monday we, it's holiday but we have a program our third panel is the mayor of Georgetown his worship the mayor, Ubrat Singh, is, uh, he couldn't make it because his uncle suffered a serious um, ailment over the West Coast and he was detained there. Once again, thanks to Gerald Pereira for his third appearance and thanks to Joel for his fourth appearance within a year of the Gildari Freddy Kisun show. We will see you on Monday at 8.30 p.m. when Nenal Gildari will be back. It was a very entertaining hour and a half, a very learning hour and a half, and I'm sure you have learned a few things from this program, especially how Joel Bagwadin puts it in terms of his dimension of the oil industry that you don't find every day in the papers, the interference of the U.S. Embassy in the 2015 election, and three Portuguese family own more land than thousands of Indians combined. Thanks for being with us. As, we, as I usually say, catch you later. I got respect for you, but... Why independent woman are you talking about? This is a bullshit cancer independent. Why independent woman? You won't see nothing as an independent woman because, because why? 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 They're coming up more. This is the conversation we have. And here, the man came got light up. When the young, the independent, yes, sir.
They screw in the world and do what they want to do. When they get old and lonely, yes, and then they holler, oh, I'm depressed. Yes, sir.